This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Strength. Well, if you want turning your attention in the scriptures, St. John chapter 6, beginning with verse 60 through verse 68, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Trust that this will speak to you in a meaningful way. Notice, Verse 60, many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? Jesus was aware that his disciples were complaining. So he said to them, does this offend you? Then what will you think if you see the son of man ascend to heaven again? And the spirit alone gives eternal life. Human effort accomplishes nothing. And the very words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But some of you do not believe me. For Jesus knew from the beginning which ones didn't believe. And he knew who would betray him. Then he said, this is why I said that people can't come to me unless the father gives them to me. At this point, many, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. Then Jesus turned to the twelve and asked, Are you also going to leave? And Simon Peter replied, Lord, to whom would we go? You have the words that give eternal life. And I'm speaking today from the subject simply, Frustrated, but nowhere to go. Frustrated, but nowhere to go. Have you ever felt that life had you sort of backed into a corner that you've been dealt a particular hand, a particular set of circumstances, and you are frustrated with the hand that you've gotten, but you've got no place to go? I mean, at the end of the day, you just say, it is what it is. This is what I have to work with. I wouldn't want this particular hand. I didn't particularly choose this hand with these particular set of circumstances that I have, but this is what I have to work with. Frustrated, but nowhere to go. Can you imagine that if the disciples of Jesus Christ got frustrated, how much more will we be frustrated in our life? And they were walking with Jesus and they got frustrated. And just as a little backdrop to this, Jesus had just finished a discourse with them, sharing with them, saying that except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have any part in me. And they misunderstood him because they assumed as though he was talking about some kind of voodoo kind of human cannibalism. And they're like, I'm not with that. And the Bible says many of his disciples deserted him and walked with him no more. And so now Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, you're going to leave me also? They misunderstood what he said. They were frustrated. But then Peter said, where are we going? You're the only one with eternal life. You've backed me into a corner, Jesus. You put me in a very precarious position here. I don't know. I mean, I've got some circumstances here. I, they're not ideal. I could do without this. If I could change some things, I'd change a whole lot. But I'm stuck with the hand that I've been dealt. This, it is what it is. And what do I do now? Frustrated, but nowhere to go. There are some people that are in bad marriages. Frustrated, but can't afford to divorce. Don't have enough to be able to pay bills and live separately. Frustrated, but nowhere to, to go. It's so interesting. But here's the thing that I've lived long enough to realize is that wherever there are people there's going to be friction and frustration. Now, this is Grown Folks Church today. Wherever there are people, there will be friction and there will be frustration. So if there are people, there are going to be friction. If, 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 if you leave one job and go to another job, listen, if there, if there are people on that job, there will be friction, there will be frustration at times. Not all the time, but at times, there will be frustration, there will be friction. And you may wonder, why in the world would God give us friction and frustration anyway? Why, why allow us to deal with frustration? May I say this to you? 
When God wants to change you, he starts by getting your attention through putting you in a situation beyond your control. So when God gets ready to change your life, he introduces you to frustration. He puts you in a situation that is beyond your ability to control it and you get frustrated. You get frustrated. You know, you could even think that, well, if I get my own business, I'll be my own boss. Well, you're not exactly your own boss because you still have to answer to Uncle Sam. And when you have to deal with the IRS, you're frustrated. Back taxes, frustrated. Payroll taxes, all kind of stuff. Rules, regulations, you get ready to build something. You got to deal with government regulation, it, it, even though you're your own boss. So nobody is truly just totally independent. If you're in this world, and if you have to deal with people, you're going to be introduced to frustration. And you're frustrated, but no place to go. Well, how do you do this? You, we have to be able to learn creatively how to function in this world so that frustration does not make us completely ineffective. I want you to understand very clearly what frustration is. Frustration is a deep, chronic sense or state of insecurity and dissatisfaction arising from unresolved problems or unfulfilled needs. This is what frustration is. This is the definition of frustration. We, we know how people are. You know, there are some people that, who are single and trying to live holy, they get sexually frustrated. They have unfulfilled needs. This is grown folks' church now. <laughs> I mean, just, just I mean, is it, you know, if it's not real, it's not true. I mean, you know, it's, it's, we're, we're just trying to get, keep it real. Is that, is that okay? We got people that are sexually frustrated, people that are frustrated due to their relationships, frustrated that are due to their finances, frustrated due to their health situation, and to compound the frustration, isn't it crazy that your relationship is jacked up, your health is jacked up, your finances are jacked up, your emotions are jacked up, your hormones are jacked up. I mean, you got frustration hitting you on every side. You just bam, bip, bop, bam. It's not just from one side, it's hitting you on every side. And you are feeling the brunt of this thing that we call frustration. And we wonder, God, what in the world am I, what am I doing wrong? I mean, what's, what's, what's the matter with me? Uh, the, the word frustration comes from a, 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 a word, frustrata. And, and it actually, the word frustra, which is the root of frustration, means in error or in vain. So when you really put it all together, the word frustrare, from which this word frustration comes, it has its basis in its meaning, meaning to deceive. All frustration has deception in it. So when we get frustrated, there is this feeling that what God has said was going to come to pass in my life is not going to happen. So we get frustrated because the circumstances are defying what we are working for and believing for. So we get frustrated because there is the temporary deception that this is not going to happen. So we get frustrated. We get frustrated with our spouse. We get frustrated with the spouse-to-be. You get frustrated with your children. You get frustrated with co-workers. You get frustrated with employers. You get frustrated with the government. You get frustrated with your doctor. You get frustrated with the people who are taking too long at the light in front of you. You get frustrated with people at Walmart and the grocery store that are in front of you and can't make up their minds whether they want this or that and taking too long. And it's like, my God, didn't you realize that you were getting up here and get in line? Why don't you... Wherever there are people, you will be frustrated. Don't you get frustrated when people know how you operate and then they deal with you and then they're not ready. They come there and they frustrate you. You know what was expected of you? Why didn't you do what was expected of you? That's what frustrates parents. You knew what to do. I told you to clean this house up when I left it. This house better. And then you get back and, and it's jacked up and you are frustrated. I'm so glad that the Bible is real and it, it connects with us right where we meet life. Life is very real to us and so the frustra 
It, it, it means in error or in vain. Because the devil gets us frustrated to make you think that everything that you've been teaching your children is in vain. He makes you feel that your child is not listening to you. Everything that you've told your child is going in one ear and out of the other. Everything you told your spouse is going in one ear and out of the other. You know, because you've told them, please, honey, please don't do this to me. Because I've asked you before. I have asked you before. This upsets me when I've asked you before. It's not like they don't know. So you get frustrated because I have, I asked you before. It's not, you were not ignorant. You know me by now. You knew this was going to get on my nerve. You know this upsets me every time. We dealt with this time and time again, and I don't understand why you keep doing fr- <laughs> And we are frustrated out of our wits. We want to scratch something. We want to pull hair out. We want to do something because we are fr- frustra. We, 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 we feel like everything I've been saying to you is in vain because you're not getting it. And so we end up fr- fr- frustrated because there is this deception that what we are doing is not working. Because you are praying for a situation to get better and it's getting worse. And we get frustrated or in error or deceived to believe that prayer is not meaningful. To think that prayer is not powerful. To think that prayer doesn't work. See, it's a deception. It's a deception so that you'll stop doing it. So whenever, you know, the devil wants to frustrate you, we get so frustrated because we've been praying for this joker. And instead of the joker getting better, he's getting worse. And so we get frustrated and then the devil wants to say that your praying is in vain. And this is why the Bible says, praying always with all kinds of prayer. You know, continuing in prayer. Praying without ceasing. Ceasing. So the best way the devil can get us To cease praying is to deceive us and to make us think that what we are praying is not making a difference. But prayer is the mitochondria of the Christian life. This is a thing that gives us power and strength. That even when it doesn't look like it, I'm just telling you, we got some folks that were unsaved and doing all kind of crazy stuff, but they had a praying grandmama. They had somebody that wouldn't give up on them. They were keeping them on the altar and said, Lord Jesus, God, that son of mine, that daughter of mine, my grandson, my granddaughter, and we were standing in faith and we were believing, praying, praying, even when we saw nothing look like it was getting better, but we wouldn't allow frustration. Here's the thing that helps me to hold on, is that frustration, frustration is always temporary. Frustration is not permanent. It is only temporary. It is only temporary. You got to breathe through it. You got to breathe through it. I know ladies when you were dating and you, you used to go out and you used to get your little business on on Friday night and on Saturday night. So now you have flashback and on Friday night when you're sitting there by yourself. You get in a little heat. Frustrated. But frustration is temporary. If I can busy myself during this time. If I can get myself occupied, if I can get my mind right, if I can just get through this thing because frustration is temporary, it will pass. Oh, you feel like, oh my God, oh, ooh, boy, they called me tonight. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But listen, frustration is temporary. It will pass. It'll pass. You can live through the moment of that temptation that is, that is working with your hormones, that is working with your emotions, that has you frustrated flustered and frustrated and deceived into thinking that this thing will always be this way. But frustration is always temporary. Say that with me. Frustration is always temporary. It is not permanent. It is temporary. It is the deception, the frustra, the deception of frustration to make you think that it is permanent. That he will never change. That she will never change. That it will never change. But it is temporary. It is temporary. And when you get a perspective, frustration, frustrated people feel like it's never going to get better. It's temporary. It is temporary. It's just a temporary 
frustration. It's a temporary frustration. You can live through it. And so we are often wondering, what is it that God is doing? But whenever God wants us to do something, we will run into difficulty where we need God's help. We will run into difficulty because God wants us to need him. He, know, he doesn't want you to have a life of ease that you can live comfortably in the world without God. There is no peace or rest to the wi- wicked or to the weary. And so that means that there are a few things. There is first declaration. You know, when you, you get ready to, to do something, there is declaration. You have to declare what you're going to do. The thing decreed, declared, shall be established. So we, that's first declaration. That's first declaration. Then after you declare it, then comes distress. You tell people, yeah, I'm going to have my own business. Oh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be my own boss. I'm, yeah, 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 dog, yeah, I'm going to, uh, yeah. You start declaring it, but then you come into distress. Yes, I'm going to have a child. Oh, yes, I'm going yes, to be a mother. Yeah, oh, yes, I'm going to be a mother. And then when your child wakes up in the night, they, they just woke up at 11.38. Now here's 117, hit it up again. I just fed you. <laughs> and they'd be up at, you know, 117, then 238, here they are, up, back up again. Then 428, here they are. Again. And you get into distress. It's okay if you're doing that for one night. But the next night, they're not going to give you a break either. They're going to put you through the next night and the next night. But remember, it's temporary. They, they do grow up. They do grow up. Now, when you're going through, when you're getting up in the night two and three times with a baby, you feel like they will never grow up. Thank God they do grow up. My wife and I are empty nesters. I'm, we, we had five children, but I, they do grow up. They do eventually grow up. I, I'm so glad that we didn't quit because they do grow up. But there's a declaration, and then there's distress, and then there is development. Because in the midst of whatever distresses you, it will develop you. It will develop you. Because out of your stress, when your muscles, you go into a gym, your muscles get distressed with the machine. But then in the midst of it stressing your muscles, it actually develops you. It develops you. It develops you. Because a person will say, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to get my body back. I'm, yeah, I'm going to get my school figure back. <laughs> you declare that. Then you go in the gym. And now you're, you know... And you can't try to, you can't really come under distress and duress and still be cute. That's not the time for all your mascara and stuff. You know, you got, you got to have, you know, you have to get duded up afterwards. But when you're going through distress, you're just trying to get through it. You're just trying to get through it, distress, and you're developing. Because the distress, the very thing that stresses you is building your muscles. The very thing that stresses you is building your muscles. Every time you birth something, you're getting ready to go through distress. Every time you open up another location in a business, you're going to distress. You're going to bring another level of stress in your life, another whole other set of problems in your life, but it's going to develop you. See, it's one thing to develop one store, one location, and get that thing running really well, but now you compound something when you think about franchising. Because now it's easy if I'm here and if I can run and oversee my own operations. But now i got two locations, three locations, four locations. I mean, I watched my daddy do it. We had five retail locations. Then we opened up a sixth one. Then we opened up a seventh retail location here in Atlanta. And it was different. You, you have to change your mindset when you go from operating one thing, which is a mom and pop operation, and you can be there and watch the cash register. But when you got seven different registers, it stresses you to come up with a different system so how in the world do I do this? Because I can't be in seven places at one time. And I only have six children. <laughs> and, and they're not all old enough to put on the register yet. So what do I do? How, how do I do that? It, and it, it, it stresses you. But in the stress of figuring that out, it develops you. That now I've got to come up with a whole other different level of thinking. Are you, am I helping anybody? Whatever, I don't care whatever it is is with, whether it's in an entrepreneurial endeavor, whether it is, it is trying to manage some, a dream, a goal, a vision in your own life. Once you declare it, it puts you in distress, which gives now, creates the opportunity to develop. So 
there is declaration, distress, development, and then deliverance or demonstration. So you're right before the stage of deliverance when you're in the development while you're you, you, you're doing that and you know it's, it, it's amazing that there's a reason that once people have developed their bodies in the, in the gym they want it to be on, on display so they're going to buy something to wear something to put on display demonstration the deliverance that has come out I mean if you've been carrying this thing for a while once you deliver it people are like well, let, let me see the baby wrapped in its swaddling clothes. They, they want to see the baby because you've been declaring, I'm going to have a baby. I'm going to have a baby. I got a dream. I'm working on something. Now you've gone into distress. You've gone through the development to be able to give birth to this thing. But once you deliver that, people want to see the baby. Let me see. What is this you've been talking about? And then they see it. They see it. God's trying to get you to the deliverance and Always, anybody who's got deliverance or demonstration, I promise you, they have been through distress. And that distress, if they didn't quit, brought them to development. It will develop you. It will develop your thinking. It will develop how you do business. It will develop you because you've got to now develop others around you in order to do it. I mean, so it develops you in brand new ways. It's the way that it is. Declaration, distress, development. Every time there's a problem, it means that you need to develop in order to be able to solve it. You develop. You can never solve a problem on the same level of thinking that created it. You work through the distress of the problem. It develops you and then delivers into you a new system of operation. And that's what we always need is a new system. We need a new system of operation. That's what God is doing. You know, I bumped into a lady the other day and, and I asked her, I said, how are you doing? I knew she had been going through some things. And she said, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> I'm absolutely, I'm fine. And, and, and I, 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 I probed some other questions, and when I really got to the root of it, I saw what her fine was. Her fine was frustrated, insecure, neurotic, and emotionally unstable. <laughs> yes, she was absolutely fine. Frustrated, insecure, neurotic, and emotionally unstable. So, man, when you ask her how she's doing, I'm fine. There is more behind that fine. Well, well, I asked her how, how she was doing. She said she was fine. You have to know a person. You have to know a person. Men, and let me just tell you this. You're asking your wife for permission to do something. You know her and she really doesn't want you to do it. And when she says, okay, fine. <laughs> Trust me, brother, don't, don't do it. <laughs> no, no, don't do it. It's a trap. But she said it was fine. No, 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 no. She's frustrated, insecure, neurotic, and emotionally unstable. <laughs> don't do it. It's to all, a word to all the brothers. <laughs> don't do it. Don't do it. Don't, don't do it. But I'm so glad that this Bible is such an honest book. It is an honest book. It has real stories with real life, real experiences, real human failure, and real redemption by God who loves us. I'm so glad. This is a real book. It's a real book. The Apostle Paul that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament here, he saw this, his spiritual children making a mess of the things that they had been taught. And there was so much sexual immorality and division in the church that Paul begins to take on a very frustrated tone in his writings in the scriptures. You know, I, I, I'm so glad because I was praying for the condition of America and our moral depravity in this country. And it just disturbed me. And I, and I guess in my own mind, I was blaming it on, on, on all of the, uh, uh, the evils that we have available to us through the internet and social media and uh, the lewdness of pictures and sites and selfies and... and uh, the nudity and all of that that is so readily available at the click of a button, the moving of a mouse and all of that to open us up into a whole world. I was blaming Facebook and Snapchat and Instagram and Twitter and, and, and all of these little secret kind of things where you can send naked pictures and then they'll disappear within seconds. And I'm blaming all of this, saying that this is the result of it. And, and then God says, no, no, no. 
What is has already been. This is not about technology. This is about sin nature in human beings. And this is not the first time that a society has been morally depraved and filled with moral profligacy and sexual immorality. And then he took me to the book. He says, let's go here to take a look at the Corinthian church. They were spiritually gifted more than they all. They spoke in tongues. They had prophecy. They had the gift of, of, of miracles. They were working. I mean, this church was loaded with the gifts of the spirit and they were sleeping with everybody going and coming. They had so much sexual immorality without the internet. Without the internet. You don't need an internet to stir up your human. No, no, no. Grandma was having her role in the hay behind the barn. She didn't have to go into a chat room. Oh, she, she would say, honey, you know, meet me over there behind the pine tree behind Mr. Wilson's house. Oh, they had their meeting places. It, it, it may not have been Snapchat, but they had a place where they were. Oh, they were chatting all right. They would go to a revival meeting and, and they would look at their eyes and say, when I, when I do like that, you know, we're we going to slip out of the back door. We're going to go. You, you know where to meet me. You know where our little secret place is. Oh, oh, no, no, no. Don't think that whoever invented the internet invented sin. They, that was just a platform. They had their own ways of chatting. They had, they could, I'm, I'm telling you, some of them sisters back in that day, they could have a whole conversation. You're talking about telepathic communication? They could look at you and tell you, baby, I like what I see. And if you want a piece of this, you can meet me and I will, we can get up and exchange our business. A few minutes after this, they could have a whole conversation with you and never type a word to anybody. They had a way of letting you know, baby, I like what I see and I'm willing to give all of this to you. Whenever, whenever, whenever you want some of this, you just, you, you know. You feel me? Before we had all of this, you feel me? You could look from across the room and they would be like, who is that? You'd be checking somebody out and communicating, talking about Snapchat. Oh, you ain't got a snap and an Instagram. Bam. Oh, you knew what the look was about. Oh, you, you knew what it was about. You know what time it is. Well, this is what the Apostle Paul was dealing with before the technology of the internet and before they had electricity. Oh, they had electricity, all right. They were feeling each other. And the Apostle Paul was frustrated. And he was very open about his disappointments and his dissatisfaction in human nature. This is human nature. It's nothing new. It's nothing new. David had a problem with it. Solomon had a problem with it. Jeroboam had a problem with it. Rehoboam had a problem with it. Are you listening to me? I'm just telling you, it's nothing new. Abraham had a problem with it. Isaac had a problem with it. Jacob had a problem with it. Moses had a problem with it. It's nothing new. And here Paul is frustrated with people because wherever there are people, there's going to be frustration and friction sometimes. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 20 and 21 in the New Living Translation. Notice what it says. This is Paul being very honest. Paul said, I'm afraid that when I come, I won't like what I find. And you won't like my response. I'm afraid that I'll find quarreling, jealousy, anger, selfishness, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorderly behavior. Yes, I'm afraid that when I come again, God will humble me in your presence. And I will be grieved because many of you have not given up your old sins. You have not repented of your impurity, sexual immorality, and eagerness for lustful pleasure. This is the Apostle Paul dealing with a spiritually gifted church. Gifted but carnal. Gifted but wrapped up in sexual sin. Gifted but lusting. Without the internet. Lust happens in the mind, not over the airways. It happens in the mind. It was happening before Facebook ever got here. It was happening before AOL. It was happening before Yahoo and Snapchat. It was happening before we had a Twitter. It, it was happening before, any, before YouTube. It was happening before Netflix and Hulu. It was already, lust was already in the world. It had already been conceived. And in the midst of all of this kind of moral profligacy and sexual licentiality, 
God still had a plan to be able to redeem his people and to speak to them and bring out of that a remnant of folks that would be faithful. My friend Stephen Furtick says that faithfulness is not a feeling. It is a choice you can make even in the midst of great frustration. It's a choice. It's not a feeling. Faithfulness is a choice. Faithfulness is a choice. Tithing is a matter of faithfulness more than of, of faith. Tithing is it's more of a matter of faithfulness. It's a decision more than even faith. You decide to be faithful. You decide to be faithful. And I just think about the fact that the Apostle Paul was frustrated with the church at Corinth, but he, was, he remained faithful to Christ. He remained faithful to his calling. In the same way, you can be frustrated with your spouse and still remain faithful to your marriage. You can be frustrated with your children and still remain faithful to teach your children and to raise them up in the godly ways of the Lord. You can be frustrated as a teacher with your students and still be faithful to teach. God is, is, can be frustrated with his people and yet still faithful to us because faithfulness is a choice. Say that with me. Faithfulness is a choice. Say that again. Faithfulness is a choice. Say it once again. Faithfulness is a choice. Getting up and being at work on time is a choice. It is a choice to be at work on time and to give an honest day's work for an honest day's wage. Faithfulness is a choice. Being on time is a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. Being faithful is a choice. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. You choose it. You choose it. So even when other folks are messing up around you, you say, that's not me. That's not my example. That is not my example. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to do what I'm paid for. You, you can goof off and do what you want to do. If they ask me, I'm going to snitch on you. <laughs> oh, they knew the bishop was a snitch. You know, you know I'm not going to do my work and then, you know, you, will not, you don't want me to turn it in because you don't have yours. I'm sorry. Don't punish me for doing what's right. You know, I had a lot of attitudes against me because the bishop was going to have his work all the time. <laughs> not some of the time, all the time. And come on and grade on the curve with my paper. <laughs> grade on the curve. My teachers use my paper as the key. So come on and grade on the curve. I just want to remind you, don't be weary in doing what's right. Don't be weary in doing what's right. Be faithful. Be faithful. Even when you get frustrated, you can be frustrated but faithful. Paul was frustrated but faithful. Jesus got frustrated with his disciples, but he was faithful. You, you, have you ever, you know, can, now, if this is not frustration, I don't know what is. Jesus says, you know, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part of me. And then many of his disciples got up and left him. And Jesus, in his frustration, he turns to the other disciples who were remaining. He said, y'all want to go too? You, you, you want to go too? That was a statement out of frustration. And, and then here his disciple. Peter says, you know, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. Where will we go? Where are we going? I'm frustrated, but I ain't got nowhere to go. <laughs> I don't have a place to go. Because if I leave this church, I'm going to go to another church with some people who have issues. I mean, why, why am I, you know, you, you know, folks that are worried of faith. Where, where else you going? You're going to find human beings wherever you go. And the very thing that you're running from, you'll find yourself running to. Blessed and multiplied. No, no, I mean, it's, will you leave too? You know, Jesus said, he was frustrated. He says, you're going to leave me too? He said, you, won't, you, you, won't be the, you, you weren't the first, you won't be the last. You, you, you said, you want to go too? Jesus was saying in so many words, can, can I give you a modern day translation? Let the door hit you where the good Lord split you. <laughs> and I mean, he's just challenging them. Jesus was frustrated with people. I mean, the people that you're banking on to help you to do what God has called you to do and they're cutting the food, arguing over some stuff that they don't even understand. They're leaving you out of a misunderstanding, leaving you because they don't even understand your heart and understand your vision and understand what you're trying to do to help people and to reach folks for the, you know, trying to build a business, trying to serve a community, trying to stay truthful to something, trying to do something as a positive people. And they don't even understand. And then they talk about, you know, we're going to stay here. And, you know, we had folks that worked in our business and said, well, we're going to make this man rich. Where are you going to work for somebody else make them rich? 
And he said, well, you leave me also. Will you leave? Frustrated. Just frustrated. Frustrated. But no place to go. Because whatever you leave from, you're going to run to. If you don't resolve the issue. That's an unresolved issue in your own heart. In your own mind. That's why if you, if you don't resolve that issue, if you don't get over that issue, you, whatever you run from, you'll find yourself running to. And impatience is inevitable for people who only live in the present. Impatience is inevitable for people who only live in the present. And this is why you have to have faith that what you're doing pays off. And you need love. You need love. You need faith in times of frustration. You need faith in times of frustration. You need hope in times of frustration. And you need love in times of frustration. Because you have to have faith that what you're doing is right and doing right pays off. And you have, you have to have hope that things will get better. Have hope that I'm working towards something that's going to turn out to be greater. Even though right now it doesn't look like it. But I've got hope. My hope keeps me from giving up. My hope keeps me from quitting. And my love. Uh, you got to have love in times of frustration because love keeps you from killing the people that are disappointing you. It really does. Love keeps you from stopping caring for people. You have to keep caring for people. You have to love people. That's why you need faith, hope, and love. Jesus told them here in verse 60, he said, you're offended at me. And it we discovered that they were offended through misunderstanding because they assumed the disciples were offended through misunderstanding. The remedy is to get clarity. Get clarity. Assumption is the lowest level of knowledge that you can operate on. Ask questions. Listen and then reply back with what you understand them to be saying. And he asked them in verse 61, he says, does this offend you? Does this offend you, what I've just said? The word offend there, does this make you stumble? Does this make you stumble? Is what I'm saying going to cause you to trip? Does this make you stumble? Because Jesus said, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood. And they didn't even understand. Jesus was saying, I want you to have communion with me. Communion, communion. You know, Jesus often taught in parables. So that people whose hearts were not right couldn't understand what he was saying. Parables were a code language so that you had to understand the heart of the king in order to understand his message. Notice in, in uh, Matthew chapter 13 verse 34 and 35. Jesus always used stories and illustrations like these when speaking to the crowds. In fact, he never spoke to them without using such parables. This fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet. I will speak to you in parables. I will explain things hidden since the creation of the earth, of the world. Because true disciples are never afraid to have communion with Jesus. So that they become one. Communion. Say communion. communion. Communion, common union. So that you have common union. We have fellowship one with another. Common union. It had nothing to do with cannibalism. It was about common union. Communion. Communion, common union, coming together. It is the root of the word communication. 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 The root of communication is a word that means common ground. We cannot communicate unless we have common ground. You see, if I were here speaking another language that you didn't understand, we wouldn't be able to communicate. It is our language Despite our racial differences, despite our backgrounds socioeconomically, it is our language that gives us a common ground and allows me to be able to communicate. It is the language. It is the language. And so Jesus spoke in a language that only people who had a heart right toward God could even understand the language that gave them common union. That's why the disciples who walked off and left him, they had no communion with him. They were around him, but didn't understand his language. Albert Einstein, as you know, he was German. A brilliant man, perhaps one of the most brilliant thinkers of the 20th century. And when he died, he had a nurse 
around him that were serving him. When he raised up and gave his last words, he uttered them in German. And the woman didn't speak German, and his last words were lost because he was surrounded by somebody who couldn't speak his language. And how detrimental is it to have a vision in your heart and you're surrounded by people that can't even understand your language? The most critical words that one of the most brilliant minds of the 20th century had to say, and here he rises up on his deathbed and utters his last words, And she said, what you say? <laughs> Missed it all. Surrounding yourself with people that don't know your language. You got to be surrounded by somebody who speaks your language. Who understands what it, you're talking about. When you said that I need to pray through and I need somebody to help me. To say that this thing almost slew me. You got to have somebody that knows what you're talking about. When you said that I was vexed in my spirit and I was quickened by the Holy Ghost. You got to have somebody that understands your language of what you're talking about. You got to have people that know what it means to pray through. That understand your language. You got to have somebody that understands what you're dealing with. Let me just remind you that when people walk out of your life, let them go. Let them go. Let them go. You're not losing what you never had anyhow. Let them go. They were not in communion with you anyway. Let them go. Let them go. It simply means that they were not critical to the fulfillment of your destiny. If people can walk away from you, God will never place your destiny in the, in the life of another two-legged human being that walks out of your life. To say now you can't fulfill your destiny. No, no, no. God lets your destiny rest in your own willingness to obey God. And as long as you say yes to God. If they walk out, God will cause the right person to walk in. He will. He will. He will. Stop trying to get people to run with you who are not headed in your direction. Because some people are not loyal to you. They are loyal to their need of you. And once their need of you changes, their loyalty does too. Very few things are forever. Very few things are forever. If you think about it, there's hell in hello. I know there are some people that you wish you had never met. Because there's hell in hello. There's good and goodbye. Some of your best days, your most joyous days is seeing somebody walk out of your life that was causing nothing. But well, I mean, and that's why when we get to heaven, it's going to be howdy, howdy and never goodbye. I'm a, but there are some things that when people have been troubled to you, it's bye bye. I don't know about you, but there's always some good and goodbye. Goodbye pain, goodbye headache, goodbye lump in the breast, goodbye, bye bye. Goodbye a person that is a pain in the, I mean, the, the neck. I mean, when that, when, when. Things that hurt you leave you. That's good and goodbye. There is lie in believe. Isn't that interesting? There is over in lover. Few things are forever. There is X in next. There's if in life. I mean, you know, there's just few things are forever. There are few things that are forever. There are few things that are forever. And this is what disturbs me when I see people get caught up in their realities in a, in a world that is in cyberspace. It's a make-believe world. Because there are too many people that are living for likes but longing for love. Most people quit because they look at how far they have to go instead of how far they've already come. And when you walk with somebody that's going to be loyal to you, Jesus got a, a group of 12 disciples he was looking for loyalty. Loyalty is about people that will stay true to you behind your back. And when they can no longer see you, they'll still remain true to the cause. Some people only say the right things when you're in the presence, when they know you can hear them. But you really prove loyalty by remaining true behind a person's back. An enemy is anybody who weakens your influence in your absence. Are you listening? That's an enemy, a real enemy. Is somebody who weakens your influence in your, in your absence. You know, when the boss man ain't around and then they're talking about you. 
negatively. They, they, they're assigning wrong motive. An enemy is somebody who weakens your influence in your absence. I mean, you need somebody that's loyal to you to say, you know what? I thank God that God put this vision in her. I thank God that he put this vision in, he, in, in him or else we wouldn't have a place to work. I'm thankful for this job. It may not be everything that I've ever wanted, but I'm thankful that I've got something that keeps my lights on, my cell phone on, gas in my vehicle. I'm, it may not be everything, but it is something. It is helping me, and I'm thankful for this person. Maya Angelou reminded us, she said, when people show you who they are, believe them. Believe them, believe them. And listen, when you look for somebody to give your heart loyalty, loyally to Look for authenticity. Look for authenticity, a genuineness. Look for integrity. Look for integrity. Look for consistency and look for loyalty. When you're really looking for somebody to give your heart loyally to, look for authenticity, genuineness, integrity, honesty. Look for consistency and look for loyalty. And listen, there's so much in the world to get us frustrated. Health issues. Financial issues, relationship issues, issues with government entities, the weather, just frustrated. Stuff that is beyond your ability to control because you plan an outdoor event and then it rains. And frustrated with issues that you cannot control. Whenever you are frustrated, stop. Whenever you are frustrated, stop. This is an acronym and this acrostic here. The S means to sit down, sit down. Because when you get frustrated, the thing that we do is we get riled up. Frustrated people get up and they start, they start talking loud. Veins come out of their neck. And it's hard for them to sit still. They, want, they just start pacing. They just, I mean, you get like, what in, what in the world? That's why when people tell you disturbing stuff, they say you might want to sit down to hear this. Sit down, sit down. Just in your posture, sit down. Remember the psalmist told us in, in, in Psalm 23, he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He makes me lie down, to lie down in green pastures. And you want to think about what is it that helps you to calm down? Is it music? Is it getting in a, in a nice tub with aromatherapy and candles? Is it going out in nature, sitting in, 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 among the trees, looking at the grass, getting fresh air? Is it taking a nice walk? Is it working out in the gym? Is it going to the mountains? What calms you down? Find that thing. When you're frustrated, stop. Sit down. Calm down. Calm down. Some people get theirs in a glass and it just mellows them out. Some people roll the stuff. I'm not advocating. <laughs> but find something that is legal and moral. <laughs> legal and moral. Legal and moral that calms you down. Going for a walk. Taking a bicycle ride. Find something legal and moral that calms you down. Sit down. Whenever you're frustrated, sit down. Sit down. The T, think, think, start thinking. What is my being frustrated solving? Is this rational or is this, am I reacting out of my perceptions, out of my feelings? Who is this helping and who is it hurting? You have to sit down and think about this because when you get frustrated, it discombobulates your thinking capacity. That's why you have to sit down, gather your composure, and start thinking. Frustrated people do stupid things. They do stupid things without engaging their thinking. They're frustrated and then they get involved in domestic violence because they're hitting somebody because of their feelings and not their thinking. Sit down and, and then think, what is this going to solve? How does this set an example for my children if they find out how I handle this situation? Think through the process. Sit down, think. The O here is observe, observe. Never put anything in front of you that you do not want in your future. Observe. You become what you behold. You become what you behold. Observe, observe. The Bible talks about it in Hebrews 
looking unto Jesus, looking, observing, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. You have to observe something. Observe good examples. Observe somebody that's been frustrated and how they handled it. Observe different alternatives, different options, different opportunities that exist for you. Observe. Start looking around while you're frustrated. Say, what are some other approaches? There are other companies that are dealing with this. There are other people dealing with situations similar to this. How are they solving this problem? Start observing what others are doing. There are solutions. There are options. Observe. Sit down. Think. Observe. Study. Research. Observe. Observe. And then you come to the P. Plan. Because failure to plan is a plan for failure. You don't get what you want in life. You get what you prepare for. You have to plan it. You have to plan it. Plan it. Schedule it to happen. Create a plan that while I'm frustrated, this is what will happen so that I don't respond out of a reaction. I don't want to just let this be a reaction. I want this to be a response. Responses always require thinking and planning. You have to think and plan a response. But a reaction is action without thinking. It's reflex. It's reflex. It's acting out of your flesh. But you have to plan. You have to come up with a plan. How do I do this? And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when you're frustrated out of your wits, Because of relationship issues, because of financial issues, because of health issues, because of timing, having to jump through hoops, you're frustrated because of the weather, you're frustrated because of things that you have no ability to be able to control, you're frustrated. And you wonder, God, what in the world do I do? You stop. And just remember, this is the thing that, that helps me at the greatest times of my own personal frustration. I remember Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God and who are the called according to his purpose. And we know, not we think, not we hope, we know that all things, all things, say all things. All things. He didn't just say the good things. All things, the good and the bad, the positives and the negatives, the ups and the downs, in sickness and in health, in, in riches and in poverty, all things, all things, all things, all things work together for my good. All things are working for my good. Say that with me. All things are working for my good. Say it again. All things are working for my good. Say it again. All things are working for my good. God has all things working for your good. And listen, every battery has polarity, a positive end and a negative end. The negative never short circuits your positive. In fact, it is the negative that empowers the positive to work. All life is born out of death. All light comes out of darkness. So one empowers the other. Don't assume that because something negative has happened, that it will short circuit the positive. God takes all things and he works them. The bitter stuff with the sweet and he makes just the right kind of taste. God can refresh you with the sweetness of the good and the bitterness of the bad and he works it all together in just the right proportion to be able to refresh your life and to restore your life. And I, I'm, I'm comforted by this that whenever I am frustrated I'm saying God I don't understand why this is happening right now but I do realize that I've declared some things and I'm in distress right now and you're developing me to bring a deliverance and a demonstration of your glory and your power in my life. And I need you, God. I need you. I need you. I need you. And I, I rest assured, God, that all things are working together for my good, for my good to strengthen me, to develop me, to make me a witness, to allow my life to be an encouragement to somebody else not to quit, to watch what they can do even without all of the credentials and without all of the education. To watch God your goodness in my life. To take me God that even when I've made bad choices and I've made mistakes and when I have sinned and I've disappointed you. That nothing God is beyond your ability to be able to redeem. My God, whatever, whatever, whatever God cannot change in your past, he will redeem. He is a redeemer, a blessed redeemer. 
And I wouldn't trust people to even share the gospel with me who've never made a mistake. You have no authority to speak grace to me if you've not had to be a recipient of God's grace. But I am comforted by the very fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that we are in desperate need of His grace. And my very fact that I can declare God's grace to you says that I am a recipient of that grace myself. And that He has washed me and He has cleansed me and He has sanctified me. He's done something, a work of restoration in my own heart and my life. And this is why I'm able to speak with the conviction in my own soul and believe that God can redeem anybody at any time. The arm of the Lord is not short that it cannot save. God is still sitting on the throne and he rules and he super rules. And he's redeeming people. And he'll take the good, good things and the bad things, the positives and the negatives, the ups and the downs. And he'll work it for your good, working it for your good, working it for your good. And he'll take the people that walked out of your life that you are using as a crutch and said, now I am strengthening you. You may walk with a limp, but you will walk. It will be a testimony. People will know that something happened, but it didn't stop you. And they'll know that you, you kept on even though you got injured in the process. Even though you got hurt in the process. Even though you were afflicted in the process. But out of your test comes your testimony. Out of your battle comes your victory. Out of your mess comes your message. God says, I've got something. Then out of the story comes your glory. You know, God, God really wants to do something amazing in you. And if you'll trust him, if you'll trust him at the very times that you're frustrated, saying, God, I don't know what I'm going to do because I feel like kicking something, hurting something. I feel like pulling my hair out. I feel like, like doing something that I may later on regret. But I'm frustrated, God, because people have let me down. They've disappointed me and people have walked out of my life and they have betrayed me because I trusted them. And nothing hurts worse than to be betrayed by people that you trusted. And only those that you love and trust have the power to even betray you. And when we're in that place and we say, God, I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you. I need you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I need you. Frustrated, but no place to go. When you are frustrated, I want to encourage you to go to the rock that's higher than you. And may I just remind you that when you are frustrated, it is not the time to pray long prayers. It's not the length of the prayer, it's the strength of the prayer. And there are some people in this room that have learned how to pray short prayers because there are some prayers you can be hurting so badly. That it becomes a one word prayer. Jesus. And just in calling that name. It says more than you can even articulate. When you're in trouble. And you're behind the wheel of a car. And your car's about to crash into somebody. You lift your hands off the wheel. And Jesus. You can be hurting. And can't even put a prayer into a sentence. But all that you can is cry. Jesus. And you can have a pain in your heart from somebody that has hurt you so badly that all that you can get out is Jesus. And you can watch somebody suffering in a hospital bed and you feel so helpless. And all you can say is Jesus. And the Bible said that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, whoever, whoever, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be rescued, shall be delivered, shall be set free, frustrated, nowhere to go, render the rock that is higher than you. When you see situations beyond your ability to control, realize that God has everything in his hands, under his control, God is in control, whether you realize it or not. Even when he permits evil to prompt profligate in the world God is in control he's ruling and super ruling and he's good and he's faithful and we love him and we honor him we love him and honor him and he's an awesome God he's an awesome God he's an awesome God we hope that you enjoyed that message don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos and if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button.
thank you for what you do.